Welcome back to another episode of Gear Review. I'm your host, Wesley Malai, and today we're gonna to talk about the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Now, I've needed to upgrade my camera for quite some time, but I've been really unimpressed with many of the options out there on the market. Sure, there are some great DSLR mirrorless cameras out there, but none of them have the majority of features that I need to make the next step in my career. Since I own all Canon lenses, I was secretly hoping Canon would release the C100 Mark III, but instead they released the C200, which is a great camera, but it costs $7,500 and is way outside of my price range. In swoops black magic with the Pocket 4K, a beast of a camera at only $1,300. It's an amazing camera at a super affordable price, but it does have its drawbacks and issues. So let's first take a look at what this camera excels at. Now I've only been using the Pocket 4K for about three months, but hands down, this camera features the best image quality out there for a camera under $5,000. It features an impressive 13 stops of dynamic range, which is the measurement between the whitest whites and the blackest blacks in an image. A higher dynamic range translates to capturing more detail in the highlights and shadows of an image, which creates a better, much more pleasant looking image when capturing scenes with a lot of contrast. We also have the ability to shoot 4K 60 frames per second and 120 frames per second in 1080. Although 1080 features a windowed sensor mode, which removes the outer portion of your image and crops into the center of the sensor. If you're not using a speed booster to reduce the crop on the camera, then the windowed sensor mode is going to crop your image even more. I'm sure there are some logistical reasons why 120 frames per second gets that massive crop, but it's really disappointing nonetheless. The camera records in 12-bit Blackmagic RAW featuring various modes of compression. We have two methods of constant quality, Q0 and Q5, and four methods of constant bitrate, 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, and 12 to 1. We also have the ability to shoot 10-bit ProRes HQ, 422, LT, and Proxy. The inclusion of professional level codecs is one of the main reasons I decided to get this camera. The ability to shoot 4K RAW at $1,300 is an absolute steal in my opinion. Shooting RAW gives us the ability to really manipulate and push the image in post without losing precious detail. So in post, we are able to import our video directly into DaVinci Resolve and change the ISO, white balance, contrast, saturation, and more. Additionally, the various modes of compression allow us to still capture raw images while saving precious hard drive space. Yes, you do need DaVinci Resolve for Blackmagic RAW, but the camera comes with the latest version for free. Currently, Final Cut Pro nor Adobe Premiere have B-RAW support but you can transcode your B-Raw clips to ProRes inside of DaVinci in order to import into those programs. Having the ability to shoot 4K and 1080 ProRes has really sped up our post-production workflow. Previously on the Canon 5D Mark IV, we would shoot in motion JPEG and then transcode all of our footage into ProRes before we could even edit. Now we can shoot in ProRes and import directly into our timeline, cutting out the transcoding process completely, allowing us to jump right into editing. All of these codecs have a really high bitrate and capture an insane amount of detail. Just keep in mind that the higher quality you want, the more cards and the more hard drive space you're gonna need. When I first heard about the Pocket 4K's low light capabilities, I was pretty skeptical. Historically, black magic cameras have not had very good low light, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that this camera performs really well in low light. It's not a low light beast like the a7S II, but I found you can capture usable images up to 6400 ISO or higher if you use the appropriate amount of denoising. The Pocket 4K's low light performance is all possible thanks to the camera's dual native ISO technology. The Pocket 4K features a dual native ISO of 400 and 3200. What this means 
means is your ISOs are going to be divided into two separate banks, 100 through 1000 and 1250 to 6400. From 1000 to 1250, you'll see the log curve reset giving us a similar dynamic range that 100 ISO would have. Notice how 1000 ISO is basically unusable, but 1250 is super clean. That's because the second bank of ISO allows us to have a lower noise floor and more dynamic range and higher ISOs than a traditional DSLR or mirrorless. Another thing I love about this camera is the ability to record directly to an SSD through the camera's USB-C port. CFast cards can be really expensive, and if you're shooting 4K RAW, you're gonna need a lot of them. Being able to record directly to an SSD has saved me a lot of money. If you do own CFast cards and would much rather record to them, then you do have one dedicated CFast card slot, and you also have one SD card slot. Personally, I would highly recommend that you just invest in a couple of SSDs since that will save you a lot of money in the long run. The camera features a very easy to navigate menu system unlike other camera brands out there. I'm looking at you, Sony. We have six different menus that just make sense. Everything you need is super easy to find. The body has kind of a cheap feel, but the form factor is similar to a DSLR or mirrorless camera, which was nice because it's familiar and doesn't feel too foreign. Now let's take a look at some of the cons of the camera and issues I've ran into while using it. You've probably heard it a million times by now, but the battery life on this camera sucks. This is the single biggest detracting factor that this camera has. Depending on the codec you're shooting, you get 40 to 60 minutes of battery life using the standard LPE6 batteries. So finding an alternative power solution is paramount. You can buy a bunch of LPE6 batteries, especially inexpensive knockoff brands, but I can't justify swapping out the battery every 40 to 60 minutes on a shoot. It's just highly inefficient and can kill your momentum. So I invested in a much more reliable V-mount solution that I'll show you guys in detail in next week's episode. There is no in-body stabilization on this camera at all. If you're coming from certain Sony or Panasonic cameras, then the lack of IBIS could be a big issue for you. This forces us to rely solely on lenses with stabilization and or gimbals, glide cams, tripods, etc. to get stabilized, non-shaky, non-jittery footage. If you want to shoot handheld b-roll and you don't have lenses with stabilization, then yeah, this is going to be a big issue for you. But since I come from a Canon background, this was never really a big deal for me since none of the cameras that I have ever owned have had that luxury. The Micro Four Thirds Crop Factor. Now I'm not a full frame aficionado by any means, but the Micro Four Thirds crop factor was one of my biggest hesitations when deciding to buy this camera. It has a 1.9x crop factor if you're using native Micro Four Thirds lenses. So a 50 millimeter lens suddenly looks a lot closer to what a 100 millimeter lens would look like. The huge crop factor makes shooting in tight spaces extremely challenging. So if you want a wider field of view, you're going to need some really wide lenses. Since I have all Canon glass, I had to invest in an adapter to use my EF mount lenses on the camera. I purchased the Metabone Speed Booster, which drastically reduces the 1.9x crop to about a 1.2 crop. This gives us a look that's somewhere between a full frame and a Super 35 look. The Pocket 4K does not have a continuous autofocus system. Combined with the fact that the screen does not rotate or swivel, it makes this camera pointless to anyone doing vlog style videos. We do have the ability to shoot RAW in 1080, which is pretty awesome if you don't want the extra resolution, but you want maximum flexibility in post. But again, we're limited to that windowed sensor mode. I'm not entirely sure of the reasons behind this. I'm sure Blackmagic does have logic there, but it's annoying nonetheless. Now I have had quite a few issues with this camera and I don't 100% know why they are occurring or how I can solve them quicker. So if you've experienced these issues and or know how to solve them, then I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. One of the biggest annoying issues I've had with this camera is that anytime I exit playback mode, the aperture resets or it's just displaying inaccurate information. So to explain this further, 
If I go into playback mode and watch a clip and then exit out, my image goes super dark. Restarting the camera or resetting the battery does not solve the issue. I have to go in, change the codec, go out, go back in, change the codec back to what I was recording in, and then the image resets. I don't think this is 100% a camera issue. I think it might have more to do with the adapter, but it's a really annoying issue and it happens constantly. Now, my final thoughts. Should you buy this camera? Who is this camera for? One thing you should really consider is the type of content you're shooting and what you would be using this camera for. This is very much a cinema camera, so if you're shooting narrative, documentary, or commercial work, then you're gonna wanna rig this thing out to make it a little more efficient. This, in turn, drastically dries up the cost. So don't think of this as a $1,300 camera. Think of it more as a $3,000 camera. Yes, you can use this camera as is out of the box for $1,300, but it'll be incredibly inefficient to do so. So if you're fine with spending the three grand total to rig this camera out, then get it. Hands down, this is the best camera out there for this price point. But if you're not okay with putting that money into the accessories to rig this camera out, then I think you should seek lower priced alternatives. No IBIS, no continuous autofocus, and no flip LCD screen make this a poor choice for a vlogging camera. Additionally, wedding filmmakers and run and gun filmmakers may want to look elsewhere for the time being. Until the battery grip comes out in late August, then it's very hard to recommend this camera for any run and gun or gimbal work. All in all, even though it's a flawed camera, I am super happy I got it. It's an absolute beast of a camera that I'll be using as a bridge to the next step in my filmmaking journey. That's going to do it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, share it, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment below, and then tune in next week for another episode of Gear Review.